We started here a couple of weeks ago a series on the fundamentals of having to do with uh, fellowship, and we spent the first sermon dealing with the matter of God's law of inclusion. Once man sinned, then of course he's separated from God, and if he's ever to be with God again, he must come back into fellowship with God. And God has a law of inclusion, which we studied and we all know to be the great plan of salvation. And that's how one comes into fellowship with God or is included once again in a saved state with God. We then notice that God has a law of exclusion. And we spent quite a bit of time, on, and will do so, on this because we want to prove that there is a law of exclusion. Well, we prove everything by the scriptures taking all the Bible says on a given point before we reason with it and draw our conclusion. And we're instructed to prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21. We began that study uh, looking at Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 17. And the reason we spent some time on that is because that's dealing with where one brother sins against another brother. At the beginning, nobody knows anything about that, but the brother that sinned against the other brother and the brother sinned against, then God. And it's taught in Matthew 18, 15 through 17 how to remedy it and keep it as private as possible. And, of course, the only time it would be put before the church is if, after taking two or three witnesses, the first uh, being that he goes himself, the next being, since he didn't hear at the first visit, then he takes two or three witnesses. And if he's not repented at that stage, then it's put before the church and the whole church goes and does what they can to get the impenitent brother to see his sin and repent. If not, then that brother is to be refused. Uh, that is, he's to be considered as a Gentile and a publican. And we know how the Jews by the law treated those who were not Jews and they were taught so to do. The reason we dwelt so much on that is because there are those who think they can go out and sin publicly, especially false teachers preaching error all over the country. But then when you respond to them publicly, they will say, well, you should have come to me first. You violated Matthew 18, 15 through 17, when that passage has not one thing in the world to do with dealing with public sins, none whatsoever. And so we wanted to teach, though, being that that's one of the passages dealing with uh, corrective discipline, what that passage actually meant and how it had been abused. Now, going from that one, another passage I want us to look at is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, that would be covering actually verses 2 through 13, and I won't try to read all of it, but the passage reads in part as follows that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. The deed done was a member of the church had his father's wife. And in, uh, it is plainly said that even these rank, worldly, lascivious, licentious Gentiles haven't been doing that. But you've got a member doing it, and you're not really upset about it at all. In fact, you're puffed up. So he says that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. Then he says, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Why? That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Then he says, know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, even as ye are unleavened. Then he went ahead to say, I wrote unto you in my epistle to have no company with fornicators, I wrote unto you not to keep company. If any man that's named a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a re reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one no, not to eat. Then he ends up by saying, put away that w the wicked man from among yourselves. And these readings are from the American Standard Version 1901. Now look at what this means. The expression might be taken away from you, according to Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, means to purge, means to remove, to cast out from the church. To remove, to cast out from the church. 
The expression purge out the old leaven from the same source there means by the removal of which something is made clean. It reminds me of when little boys are taking their baths and their mother says, did you watch behind your ears? It's amazing how we can be so particular about our little boy being clean, but when it comes to the spiritual body of Christ, sometimes we don't wash behind the ears. The expression, not to keep company with, obviously means stop extending the right hand of Christian fellowship to that person. Then we may draw these conclusions from what those passages further mean. Number one, it's possible for a child of God to so act as to warrant his exclusion from the fellowship of faithful members of the Lord's church. And two, when this is the case, in order for the rest of the church to be faithful to Christ, it must, there's no choice in the matter, it's obligatory, it must exclude from its fellowship such offenders as we've seen described here. Language means anything. It certainly says that. If you were to say, well, I don't think it says that, well, then how would you say it in order to say what it does say? Those who, because of a misguided sense of, of love and tolerance and compassion, refuse to exclude such from the fellowship of the faithful, simply find themselves also in rebellion against God in so refusing. This is the case, simple reason, because the Bible plainly teaches that such exclusion is to take place. If not, when you're teaching 1 Corinthians 5, 2 through 13, you want to get over to the members what it means. Well, if it doesn't mean what we've just concluded, then you've got to show what it does mean. Now turn with me to 2 John, verses 9 through 11, little one chapter book. And uh, again, we notice uh, American Standard Version 1901, Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the teaching of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the teaching, the same hath both the Father and the Son. If, we, <clears throat> if anyone cometh to you and bringeth not this teaching, receive him not into your house, and give him no greetings. For he that giveth him greeting partaketh in his evil works. Now think about it for a moment. Could language be clearer? Now remember, we're not just trying to look at these passages and say that stands all alone, not related to any of these others. No, not so. All these passages must be taken into consideration. And this passage plainly teaches that whosoever presumptuously goes forward and does not abide in the teaching of Christ that is, he doesn't abide in the authorized will of Christ set out in the words of the New Testament. Does not have God. What does that mean? You don't have God's approval in the doing of it. If we move the mechanical instrument of music in here today <clears throat> and played it right along with our singing, uh, would God be happy? Would he approve of it? Would we have God in the doing of it? Well, of course we wouldn't. If we were to stand up here and Offer the invitation for people to be saved. Tell somebody all you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Ask Him to come into your heart. Would we have God in the doing of that? Would it be approved by the New Testament? Certainly not. And thus we have been back to Colossians 3.17. Whatsoever you do. Now how broad is whatsoever? Whatsoever you do in word or in deed. What you teach and what you do. You do it then in the name of Christ, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. The name of Christ by His authority. And that's what's being pointed out. It's further clear that if anyone comes and does not bring this teaching, then faithful children of God are neither to receive Him into their houses or to give Him greeting. There should be no support in any form or fashion to somebody that teaches false doctrine. Now remember, these passages are... The last one and this one, all are written to members of the church concerning how to be faithful in the church. Going on with this, it's clear that the break in fellowship must come at this point, at the point where one's conviction 
must be compromised in order for the fellowship to be maintained in regard to the matter which is involved. Now, we're hearing people all the time say, well, what is the big deal about humming, about uh, uh, playing with mechanical instrument music? What's the big deal about having just one prayer and in it thanking God for the fruit of the vine or the bread and the fruit of the vine? Or what difference does it make whether we get one before the other? Why? Well, it's a matter of words conveying to us what God wants. It all comes down to that. God said what he meant, and he meant what he said. And it's up to us, with an honest heart, Luke 8, 15, to look into that. So we must no longer extend the right hand of fellowship to a disciple when his beliefs and or practices force one to join in matters which are opposed to scriptural teaching. Again, such as mechanical instrument music and worship or support of societies and institutions that themselves are not authorized by the Bible and or other unscriptural institutions or activities. This is highly important. And yet we live in a day and age that just does not appreciate doctrine. We've had people over the years I've been here and some lately care nothing about leaving a congregation, this one in particular, and going to some other congregation which does not teach the truth on things. Now, I don't understand why doctrine is any less important today than it was yesterday or 100 years ago or when Paul wrote these words or Peter wrote these words or John wrote these words. It's the doctrine that makes the difference. If not, then just go do as you please. But the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Which means it is not in man that walketh the directed steps. We must depend upon God's revelation and learn how to study it. So we dare not then run ahead of God. We must abide in the doctrine of Christ. And those who do not are simply people who are in error, and they themselves must repent. And those who are faithful have no authority from God to continue in uh, Christian fellowship with them. But let me notice another passage. Are you beginning to notice how many of these passages are in the scriptures in the different books saying basically the same thing, how plain, frank, candid, and straightforward they are? In 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15. Remember, we're pooling these together, for in general, they all apply to discipline. The passage reads in part, again, in part, Now we command you, difficult to understand, the we is the apostolic we. We command you, you, the who, the brethren at Thessalonica is where he had occasion to write this. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which they received of us. What is that tradition? Well, that's the reason Paul got so upset with the Galatian churches and wrote what he did in Galatians chapter 1. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other doctrine unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. The American standard says anathema, which literally means a teacher who teaches a gospel different from what I, Paul, preached unto you ought to be cut off. And so that's the point made. But notice he goes on here. And if any man obeyeth not our word by this epistle, note that man that ye have no company with him to the end that he may be ashamed. And yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now it's interesting to me here that I've seen some brethren say, Well, don't be so hard on him, you'll make him ashamed of himself. What does it say here? When a member of the church is engaged in whatever sin it is, and they're not ashamed of themselves wearing the name Christian, in doing so when they know it violates the truth, what are you going to do to turn them around if they're not ashamed of sin? The Bible says here this is a last-ditch effort to make them ashamed of themselves. They're not living such a life as they can assemble with the faithful. And in that day and age, you may believe in Christ, but you're going to be rejected by most everybody around you and that pretty sharply. 
And so when the church would not fellowship you because of the sin of which you would not repent, which is either deed or teaching or both, then the world around them wouldn't receive them, and they were pretty much left alone to make them ashamed. And yet he says here, don't count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. You mean you can make your brother ashamed and not, and he not be your enemy? The Bible says you can. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. You ever shamed your child or remember your mama shaming you for doing something you knew better? It completely ruins the idea of shame on you. Well, I'd hate to know we reach a stage to where you couldn't be ashamed of ourselves for violating God's will while we wear the name Christian. This is an area of fellowship that many of us don't see as we talk about how important our fellowship, our Christian fellowship is, one with another and keeping us on the road to heaven. So the passage is plainly teaching that faithful Christians are to withdraw from, that is, to avoid, to literally shun, to abstain from intercourse with, to keep away from, to stand aloof from those who walk disorderly. This means that the right hand of fellowship must be withdrawn. The expression, walking disorderly, is a general term referring to all who live in rebellion to the sacred scriptures. Now, remember, this is not written to people outside of Christ. This is written to people who obey the gospel, who are new creatures in Christ, who are saying that they want to serve Christ more than anything else, but they've got caught up in a sin. It's granted that the particular sin here, which is under consideration uh, among the brethren at Thessalonica, was the sin of, of idleness. But it must not be supposed that the term walking disorderly refers only to those who are idle. In other words, you could beat the stuffings out of somebody, but you could withdraw from them if they didn't repent, but you had to withdraw only from those who are idle. Well, that's asinine. <laughs> Matthew 27, 4 does not teach that the only way to sin is to bring innocent blood, but you do sin when you do. And the same thing's true here in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15. To walk disorderly is to walk simply out of step with the way Christians are to walk. It is a military term, ataktos. And it shows plainly that it applies to you're out of step. You're not keeping rank. So there is an order, there is a pattern that characterizes Christian conduct, Christian living. And when Christians step out of rank, when they get out of step, then they're to be corrected. And it includes then this sin of idleness that uh, brought forth this teaching. But since the sin of idleness is not the only way you can be disorderly, then it does not begin and end with idleness. So... We can draw from this passage that it's possible for brethren to walk disorderly. That is, it is possible for brethren to walk not according to sound doctrine or wholesome teaching. And after a proper procedure has been followed, then we can draw proper conclusions and note that person. If he will not repent or she will not repent for our move with them is to get them to repent. We love them and want them to go to heaven. And if they don't, then uh, we are to withdraw the right hand of Christian fellowship that has been extended to them. Well, that is 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15. But go to the Roman epistle. Again, are written to Christians. In Romans 16, 17, and 18, here's how this passage reads. Paul's closing the letter to the church in Rome. Now, I beseech you. Beseech as I am bowed down on bended knee, begging you to listen to what I'm saying. Brethren, mark them that are causing the divisions and occasions of stumbling, contrary to the doctrine which ye learn, and turn away from them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by their smooth and fair speech they beguile the heart of the innocent. Now that word translated mark means to fix one's eyes up on, 
to take special attention to that given person. We'd say, this means you. It's to give direct attention to. So faithful children of the living God, members of the body of Christ, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, Christians are to fix their attention upon those who cause division and occasion of stumbling contrary to the doctrine of Christ. Now after this has been done, Faithful Christians are to turn away from them. The reason assigned for such action is that, notice, they that are such. Watch it. They that are such, A, do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ. B, but they serve their own belly. And C, by their smooth and fair speech, they beguile the hearts of innocent brethren. Thus, conclusion, they endanger their own souls and the souls of others. From this passage, we must draw a conclusion for it was written for us to know and understand and draw a conclusion as to what it means in our lives. We can conclude the following. A. It is possible for brethren to cause divisions and occasions of stumbling contrary to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. B, those who do such are not serving Christ. They're serving themselves. C, in doing so, what's the outcome? They deceive, thoroughly deceive babes in Christ and perhaps even others as well. And D, in regard to all such, faithful Christians are to both mark and turn away from them. Now there are those, and they've been around for years in the church, who would have us to believe that this passage refers only to those who have a wrong attitude. Well, of course, attitude is involved, and right attitudes are taught in the Bible. But it doesn't begin and end with just a wrong attitude. And that would be the factious attitude. You've got to only, before you can treat a person this way in the church, he's got to have the factious attitude. Well, that's not so. It's obviously wrong because no man can ever know another man's attitude unless either God or that man explains it accurately. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 and Psalm 139. What we are told to judge, aren't we? Judge, righteous judgment. So what can, underscore can, and what must, underscore must, we do? We judge actions. By their fruit ye shall know them, Matthew seven fifteen through 20. We cannot know the thoughts in the inner recesses of a man's heart. We can know, though, the manifestations of that heart's thinking. We can see the actions. Well, we might even be as sincere as a human beings could be in a certain religious group and move the mechanical instrument of music in and start partaking of the Lord's Supper once a month. Well, I'm not going to judge their motives. Their motives may be just fine. But I judge their actions. And that kind of action, the two instances I gave as examples, are not taught by the Scriptures. They're foreign to the Scriptures. Somebody says, well, I'm a Christian. Well, that's good. You're off Christ? Yes, I'm a Christian. Well, were you baptized for the remission of sin? No. I prayed to God, forgive me, and ask Jesus to come to my heart. Now, what are you going to think in your mind? That's where your judging takes place. If you know the will of Christ, you know that person's not a Christian. That person may be as sincere as he can be. Well, just bring it on over to the church. The human processes don't change. What did Paul have to do to write the Corinthian letter? He had to hear of the beliefs and actions of the church at Corinth, which were contrary to the authority of Christ. And he wrote to them what to correct in their attitudes and actions. So in this particular case, we can see his refusal, that is, anyone like this it's to repent after proper procedures been followed and trying to persuade him 
all over to his extended we could to get repentance out of him, but he doesn't. Then we have to withdraw the right hand of fellowship from him. And we'll cover one more for today. In Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, Paul writing to the young preacher, he needed to know this for his own Christian living and what he was teach to those that would come under his teaching. A man that is heretical after a first and second admonition refuse knowing that such a one is perverted and sinneth being self-condemned. Again, I say that's the American Standard 1901. I've watched brethren all my life see somebody just keep on doing sin. And they'll come up and soft talk him and do everything in the world. person just keeps right on. A week goes by, a month goes by, months go by, plural, and people keep saying, hope you'll change. Did you notice how few words it took for Paul to say by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to this young preacher what he was to do himself and what he was to preach? A man that is heretical after a first and second admonition refuse. You better want to add something to that? <laughs> Knowing that such a one is perverted. What? This is a knowledge claim. He's heretical. Refuse him after the first and second admonition. He's perverted. He sins. He's condemned himself by doing what he's doing and won't change. Now what's the church supposed to do about it? Well, we need to know that to be a heretic is to be an espouser and follower of false doctrine. The man who persists in the teaching of any false doctrine even in the face of efforts to persuade him to repent must be rejected or refused. Can we conclude any lessons from this passage that are reading mean on the day of judgment, what it means now and what it meant when Paul wrote it? Yes. A, it's possible to be a heretic. B, such people should be admonished by faithful brethren, which means we can know who's faithful and who's not. C, when a heretic will not repent, he must be rejected. He must be Refuse. He must be withdrawn from by the faithful brethren. It doesn't take forever and a day to do that. Now, I'm going to add more to this, but time's moving on. I'm going to add a lot more to it. But here's one reason I wanted to do it this way. Most of the time when we go through studying one of these books, we'll come across these passages and we'll talk about it. We'll study it and we'll understand it. But when you do it like this, you see just how much is said in frank, candid, pointed, blunt terms about the same thing over and over again or different facets sometimes of the same thing. There is a lot said to members of the church about keeping your ranks pure. To the faithful child of God, it's going to say, I need to be particular about what I think and about what I say and don't say and where I say it. And what I do, because anything that anybody else can do that's sin, I can too. If a person can be a false teacher, so can I. If a person can do any of the list of sins of worldly things that are listed in Galatians 5, so can I. I think one of the, I think one, yeah, one of the greatest steps that the devil can get you to make is to get you to think, I'd never do that. I'd never do that. I wouldn't be a fornicator. I wouldn't be an adulterer. I wouldn't use foul, corrupt language. I wouldn't tell dirty jokes. I wouldn't forsake the assembling of the saints. And on and on you can go adding to that. Well, I would never do that. I'm a Christian. I'm of Christ. I was baptized in Christ for the remission of my sins. Well, there's a whole lot of the New Testament written to those who are baptized for the remission of sins about what they were doing. It was wrong. And what the faithful were to do to get them to straighten up and what happens if they don't repent and straighten their lives up. The sad part about it is there's a whole, folks, a whole bunch of folks who are in my position as a preacher. It's not that they stand in the pulpit and teach so many things that are outright wrong, explicitly wrong. They just don't preach all they ought to preach. 
they uh, kind of get like oysters when it comes to things that might be a moving sermon. They're just not going to deal with some things that are issues right now, especially in the church that issues their paycheck. Oh, preachers would never be that way. Why, if you believe that, you're already going down the road somewhere and it's not good. Why do we think that? I don't know. When we've got so many passages like this, it says, be very careful. Examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith, except you be reprobate. Over and over again, these things are said and charges given to the faithful for the church to keep its ranks pure. And we get very tolerant where the Lord is not tolerant. We cannot be so tolerant that we allow members of the church to continue in sin. We just can't do it. Not in expect to go to heaven ourselves, for we sin in so doing. So I want to close here with this one. We'll add a little more to it before we come right down to how we form the law of exclusion. The reason I'm spending time on this is because for about 50 some odd years, there's been a whole host of people and they've grown as the years have go by, gone by that simply try to say, first of all, you don't have to do exactly what the Bible says. God's grace by His love, you're perfect. you can't be perfect. You know you're not perfect. Well, even the Bible says that we should say we have sin. So therefore you begin to tolerate it in your own life and the lives of everybody else. But what people fail to realize is that when that person who is faithful to God is striving with all of one's heart to study the truth, to correct one's life, and to live by the truth, then that's where the favor of God comes in and makes up the difference. Brother Deber used to say, we ought to study at the end of a hoe handle. Now, what did he mean that? He said, we ought to pray at the end of a hoe handle. Well, you're doing all you can and your responsibility to weed that garden. Do what a hoe is meant to be used for in a garden. But then don't you have to depend upon a lot of the grace and favor of God in the process of hoeing that garden? God gives us the sunshine, the rain, all those things, but we still got our part to do. Those are the ones that bask in the favor of God and the blood of Christ continues to cleanse them. God knows their heart and they're striving with all their power to know the Word of God and do it. And God never did say you can do that, but you'll never learn it. No, He says you can know it. You can know what's right. You can know the plan of salvation. You can know from the heart when you've done it. You can know you were honest when you did it. You can know that you're assembling to worship God in spirit and in truth. You can know the acts of worship. You can know you're studying the Bible daily. You can know you're praying to God. You can know you're praying according to the model prayer. You can know that you are praying the things you ought to pray. You can know when you're penitent. You know those things. And you just simply stay steadfast at it. And guess what's going to happen? Heaven will be your home because God will make up the difference through the blood of Christ when you're striving to walk the straight and narrow way. That's what it means in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. But when you take a position on grace, it says I can just pretty well get out here and do whatever I can do because after all, I can't be perfect anyway. Forget about grace. God will see you using that hole. He even wants to see you keeping it sharp. As you strive to bring every thought and subjection to Jesus Christ and set your affections on things above, not on the, on the earth, then God's going to make up the difference. That's where Jesus' life came in and the blood that he shed, and that's how it covers us. Why, certainly we haven't reached where we want to reach. If Paul could make the statement, I have not yet attained. But this one thing I knew, well, what was cleansing Paul of his sins when he had not yet attained with this one thing he did? Why, well, it was the blood of Christ of 1 John 1, verse 7. Well, if he needed the blood of Christ, what about you and what about me? And how we continue to have the blood cleansing us? It's when we're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us. It's when we are working at the end of that whole handle in the garden to keep the weeds out and doing all those things. We'll benefit. We'll make a crop, and we'll be able someday to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. 
So I hope this study on fellowship as we go on through it will help us be more determined than ever to put all we can into it and noticing God will make up the difference. There's the wonder of it all. So if you need to become a Christian this evening, then we hope you'll do so. As a child of God, if you've sinned, maybe your life's brought reproach on the blood body of Christ, we invite you to repent of those sins, pray God for forgiveness. If you respond to the invitation, we ask you to do it now while we stand and sing.